Are you making a vampire movie? Yeah, you are! Welcome to episode two of Your Vampire Movie, where we talk about how to make your very first vampire movie, really any movie, but assumedly with a vampire in it, without spending a lot of money. In this episode, we're going to be talking about writing your screenplay. Oh yes, this is very exciting. But if you haven't seen the previous episode where we talk about getting started, I would recommend go check that out first because there's a bunch of stuff in there that uh, directly pertains to what we're going over in this one. So check that one out first and then come back here and we can start writing. Also, this is going to be referencing one of my vampire short films quite a bit to, to show some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, and that is Lucy X Mina. And if you want to watch that before I go through and break down several pieces of it, you can watch that here. It's 17 minutes long. They won't be spoiled on anything when I start talking about it. So, you have answered the four questions from the magical formula in the previous episode. And now we're going to get started actually writing. And there are four steps to actually writing your screenplay. And we're going to go over that right now. The first step is your boundaries. The second step is your pages. The third step is your story. And the fourth step is the last step. That may sound a little mysterious, but we'll get to that. And it's one of the most important. So let's get started with the very first step, which is your boundaries. And what do I mean by that? Remember last episode when we asked the question, who, what, and where do you have available to you? Those are your boundaries. The trick to shooting and actually finishing a movie is to know what your resources are ahead of time and then build the movie out of that. Do you have access to a sports car? Great. Put that in your movie. Do you have access to a farm? Fantastic. Put that in your movie. Does your uncle own a deli shop? Great. You've got sandwiches in your movie. And your cemetery and your church and your spooky forest and the rock quarry on the outside of town and that dope-ass mural behind the bicycle shop on Cass Street. All of that is going in. These are the edges of the envelope that you're going to work within. And you might be one of those creators who's like, I do not like to work within restraints. And that's fine for almost every other art form that is out there. But unfortunately, with movies, you are very much working within restraints. And you are sharing that limitation with every $200 million blockbuster movie that Hollywood makes. Every movie shoots within restraints, shoots within boundaries. Everyone. Everyone. And the best movies are the ones that are able to weaponize their boundaries. So get comfortable with them because they are quite literally your superpower. They create the cocktail that makes your movie uniquely yours. So like we've been saying this whole time, write down all the stuff that you have access to and then begin to tease your story out of that. Now, are you going to wind up writing some stuff that you don't have access to? Of course. You do have to let the creative process happen. But having to source one thing that you don't have is a lot easier than having to source everything in order to make your script work. Writing a story that takes place in the back alleys beneath towering skyscrapers when you live in a rural farming community is kind of ensuring that you'll never make that movie. So let me give you an example. When I sat down to write Lucy X Mina, I realized that I needed a coffin. That's just where the muse took me. 
I needed for one of my two main characters to spend half the movie in a coffin. And I don't have a coffin. Like, no access to a coffin at all. So that one thing was what I wound up spending the most amount of my meager budget on in order to get access to. And that wound up being $300 when you tally up, like, how much it took to rent the coffin from a, a, a prop rental house, how to, uh, you know, getting a U-Haul to go and pick it up, another U-Haul truck at the end of the weekend to take it back to the place. So $300... And that was my, sort of my big rental for the show. But that was the only thing that I didn't have. So like, big dark room to shoot in? Check. Friend with lots of fake assault rifles and SWAT gear? Check. Friend with a DSLR camera to shoot it on? Check. Uh, fake blood, samurai sword, red sunglasses? Check, check, check. Balcony overlooking Wilshire Boulevard, absolutely check. Two actresses who are just going to absolutely kill it in this movie, check and check. The only thing that I didn't have was a coffin. But I just listed off to you my pile of stuff that I gathered together on my list that I had access to already. So embrace your boundaries. Now, there's one last little footnote that I want to make here. Uh, and normally I wouldn't do this, but I, it's, it's something that I have seen basically sabotage multiple, multiple scripts that friends have written for short films that they wanted to make. So I think it's worth bringing it up here so that you know to avoid it. And that is setting a scene inside of a restaurant, bar, cafe, convenience store, someplace like that. Do not do that. The reason being that any place like that that relies on the patronage of the public coming in and spending money is not going to allow you to shoot there, even with permission, unless either A, you spend enough money with them to where it makes up the loss they're going to have closing the place down for a shift. Or you shoot there after they close at the end of a day. So you may know somebody who owns or manages a restaurant or bar or convenience store or something like that, but even if they give you permission to shoot there, you're not going to be able to actually enter the place until they close. That could be midnight. You may have a window to shoot between midnight and like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or something like that. And that's a really hard series of hours for any cast and crew to do, especially when they have lives, jobs, school, all that kind of thing. So, but not only that, is that even if you can get your crew, cast and crew in there, all of your equipment, your lighting set up, and all, you know, get the camera in there, uh, you know, do a couple quick rehearsals, block the scene for a walkthrough, and then start shooting, you're probably not getting your first shot off until you've already been there for two hours. And that means that by the time you hit the owner walking in and saying, okay, it's that time we agreed on. Everybody's got to pack up and get out of here. You're only halfway through your shot list and you have to walk out and you're never going to get that place back again. So find a way, if you absolutely need the events of your story to take place in a setting like that, figure out a way around it. For example, if you need for two characters to be having a conversation over coffee, instead of putting it in a cafe, set it in a park where they're having coffee on a bench talking to one another. If you need for there to be a romantic date night meal, instead of putting it in a restaurant, put it on one of your characters uh, in, in their home on a couch over takeout. 
if you need for your vampire to be buying beer for a bunch of teenagers in order to take them someplace, get them drunk, and then eat them, instead of putting that in a liquor store or convenient mart, stick all the action in the car outside. The vampire walks up with the six pack of beer and the scene continues from there. So save the restaurant location for movie three instead of movie one. Because by that time, you'll have a crew that you can work with pretty quickly. You'll have actors who you can work with pretty quickly. You will have experience that you can bring to bear to move faster. And you might also have a little bit of a name for yourself by that time. And you might have had some doors that have opened for you. And you might have a little more coffin money at that point. Okay, so that's, that's enough of me getting all up in, in, in your business. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to part two, which is the actual pages, the, the actual screenplay itself. So let me start this out with just a little bit of an anecdote. <clears throat> so when I was at the end of high school and I had, you know, made a couple of short movies with my high school buddies on VHS and I was like, okay, it's time to make the big one. And I wrote this, you know, this, this very elaborate, uh, you know, sort of modern day fantasy story that had all kinds of, you know, teenage angst with my opinions about society and religion, all this stuff that just kind of makes me cringe a little bit when I, I think back on the story. But I wrote the entire thing in a notebook. And then when it came time to shoot, and I had my actors in costume on the set with the camera set up and everybody ready to go, I would hand them the notebook and like three to seven people would all crane their necks over one another's shoulders to read for the first time their dialogue in my handwriting with scratched out parts with little arrows leading to line changes and stuff like that. And it was a disaster. And that was 100% my fault. It was also the first time any of these people were seeing their lines for a scene. And it was also the, f it was because we, when you shoot a movie, you shoot everything out of order. Nobody there had read the script. They, di they didn't know what the story was. They didn't know how the scene they were performing in at that moment connected to anything else. So please learn from my mistakes, write that screenplay and have it in a form where you can email it as a PDF or you can print it out and hand it to somebody in advance of shooting. So in this way, the actors will have time to not only read the entire story, understand what's happening, but they can prepare and they can get into character and do all of the things that they need to do. And your crew knows what they're in for. They have some ideas of what they need to prepare in order to be able to shoot the thing. And not only that, but there are multiple copies of it that you can bring with you, print it out in case somebody forgets a line, somebody doesn't remember what's supposed to be going on and you don't have to worry about, you know, is it coming up on somebody's phone? Is the Dropbox link working? Something like that. You can just hand them a stapled script. They can look through it, have a couple highlighters there. It just makes the entire process work so much better. And screenplay format is designed to make it as easy as possible for everyone to read and understand what's going on in the script. Now, what sorts of software do we use to write a screenplay in proper screenplay format? Well, the industry standard screenwriting software is Final Draft. And that's what all the professional screenwriters use. That's what the entire movie industry uses as uh, the, the full suite of tools 
to do all kinds of things from scheduling to budgeting, all that sort of stuff. Stuff that you're not going to need it to do. And Final Draft is also the most expensive one. And uh, at the time of recording this, it costs about $200. That's a lot of money to pay for a piece of software that you may only write a 10-page script from. Uh, so unless you are somebody who really wants to delve into screenwriting, or become a professional screenwriter or something like that, I would recommend maybe staying away from that. Um, next up, you've got Scrivener, which uh, any of my self-published authors out there are going to be like, oh my god, Scrivener is my writing tool. Absolutely. Scrivener costs about 50 bucks at the time of recording this, and it has screenplay formatting in it. Uh, and that's, that's a really great option because um, it's a lot more affordable. There's also uh, a writing software called Celtix, C-E-L-T-X. And that one is, I think, about $20 to $25 and has is complete screen screenplay formatting in it. Um, but there are also going to be a ton of little tiny apps uh, on that you can download on your phone or on your tablet or, or, or just on your computer itself. And any of them are fine. You're essentially creating an overly glamorized text document. But one thing to bear in mind if you're not using sort of one of the big three that I talked about at the beginning of this is that you want for whatever piece of software you get to be able to export some kind of a file that you can use somewhere else. So, and, and the reason for this is because you don't want to download something called my script is dope app and you get done writing your script over the course of like, you know, a couple weeks to a month or something. And then the latest OS update happens for iOS and the creator of the app is tired of it. They don't want to update it. And so suddenly you can't open the app anymore and you no longer have access to the script that you wrote. So, just make sure that whatever you write it on, you're going to be able to move it to other software or you're going to be able to turn it into some kind of a document that you can get at at a later date. So, so those, are, those are the types of software that you're looking at. But what is screenplay format really? Now, there are YouTube videos out there that there are hours and hours worth of them. There are entire books that you can buy that are all about just writing screenplays. And I encourage anybody watching this to read some of those books, watch a bunch of those YouTube videos, totally fine. But if you don't have time for that, let's just go over kind of the broad strokes here real quick so you at least know what it is that you're looking at and you can just get started writing. So the thing to remember about screenplay format is that there are a couple different types of text that you're going to be using that are spaced differently so that anyone can understand at a glance exactly what they're looking at. So the first and most obvious segment is what we call action. And this is description about what is going on. Where are we at? Who is there? What is happening? And that goes pretty much from uh, the left in indent all the way over to the right indent. Uh, crosses the entire page. The second part of formatting is going to be dialogue. And dialogue takes place right in the middle and is, is super compressed and in these squat little blocks all the way down the page. It's going to start with a centered character name and then it's going to have that character's dialogue so that an actor can quickly go through and see, here's where my character shows up, here's my dialogue, here's the other characters. They can go through and highlight it, or they can just easily chase it down and track it. The third little selection of text is what we call a slug line. And this is all caps, and it gives three pieces of information at the beginning of every new scene. And those, and it may look a little like a little bit like a code when you look at it for the first time, but here's how it breaks down. 
It starts off with a three-letter prefix. It's either INT for interior or EXT for exterior. And that basically means, uh, in movie language, we're shooting indoors, possibly on a soundstage, or we're shooting outdoors, which means we have to deal with the sun and the wind and uh, outside sound and all that sort of environment. So it's, it's a quick way for anybody who is having to do a script breakdown or a budget or figure out locations can look through and see, okay, how much of this do we shoot in controlled circumstances and how much do we shoot in a less controlled circumstance? So that's the first little bit. The second bit is what is the location? Where is the scene taking place? And it's usually just a very generalized word. It's like living room or pond or park or the mall or something like that. It's not Century City Mall. It's not... Uh, my friend Alan's apartment. Uh, it's basically just a word that can tell anybody reading it quickly what the space is so that they can figure out lighting, uh, where do we go find this place? And then the, ver the third piece of information at the end is going to tell the reader whether it takes place in the day or if it takes place at night. So it's going to say day or night. Or possibly it might say magic hour. And magic hour is that glorious 10 minutes of beautiful light right at dawn or dusk. And if you're going to shoot anything at magic hour, make sure there's no more than one line of dialogue because that time goes like that and then it's gone. Um, so that's what a slug line is. It's basically just a shorthand to get across some very simple information about the scene quickly. And now you know about screenplay formatting. The rest of the stuff is, is just sort of learn at your own pace if you want. But I have just given you all the information for actually physically writing a screenplay right there. Having said that, here are a couple little extra bits, uh, or just extra little tips in writing a screenplay. Um, a screenplay differs from a novel or a piece of prose in the fact that you don't have to convey everything to the reader. The visuals will be conveying everything to the viewer once you've shot it but you don't need to put in lots of direction about the camera pushes in from this to that and it reframes on the... Nobody needs to know what the camera is doing in your screenplay. You figure that out with your director of photography after you've got the screenplay, after the, after Ed, the camera crew has read the screenplay. There's, we'll go into all of that when we get into actual pre-production, which is the next episode. But you don't have to put any camera information in your screenplay. You also do not need to put any overt directing of actors in the screenplay either. For two reasons. One, it takes up a lot of space. Nobody wants to read that. Second of all, Part of the actor's job is to take the screenplay and to interpret what they feel the character is about and what they're doing, and to figure that out on their own, to then come to you and the two of you together, put, put both of your ideas together, and actually create the character. And that happens during a conversation, that happens during rehearsal. So that doesn't need to go into the screenplay either. And... Part of the reason why it's important to keep the screenplay as slim as possible is because of a certain metric that we're going to use that is universal across the entire movie and television industry. And that is this. One page of screenplay generally equals one minute of screen time. So what that means is that 
if you have a script that is 10 pages long, your finished movie is going to be roughly 10 minutes long. So I just let you in on a little bit of magical information there that the entire movie industry uses to figure out their budgeting, their scheduling, everything like that, and now you can too. So using that equation, we can very quickly realize that uh, an hour of television, which is usually about 46 minutes or so, if we're talking about network TV, means a script that is about 46 pages. And a feature length film that is usually about two hours means a screenplay that is 120 pages. So this comes to our last little bit of advice that I would like to give you to think about, and that is when making your very first screenplay for your very first movie that you intend to shoot, don't make it any longer than 10 to 15 pages. That means your finished movie is not going to be any longer than 10 to 15 minutes. That means that it's roughly going to take probably about four days to shoot. That is a perfectly acceptable amount of time for people to give up out of their personal lives to help you out with something like that. The, more, the longer you make that screenplay, the more you're asking of them to sacrifice on behalf of your movie. And for the first one, you want to have some space to play around in. You want to break some eggs. You want to make some mistakes and try some things out. And if you make it 10 to 15 minutes long, that also has the added benefit at the end of being much more enjoyable for an audience to watch and makes it a lot more interesting to film festivals. Because it's easier to program something in a film festival that's short than it is something that's long. So just, you know, keep that in mind. I'm not saying send your first movie out to film festivals. I'm just saying it's a good mind space to get into. All right, third section. Let's talk about your actual story. Ooh, your story. Okay, so uh, I don't remember... I don't remember the guy's name who I heard this from, but it was an amazing piece of advice uh, that I, I cannot get behind enough. And I was very happy that he said this so that I could follow it. So I'm going to share it here with you. And this was a uh, guy who was a uh, television writer producer. And what he said was, uh, you know, think about that project that you've been working on in your mind for the last three years. That that wonderful epic uh, masterpiece that you is going to define who you are as an artist. And take that and put it to the side and leave it there for your first couple projects. And that crushed my heart when he said that because I was like, oh my God, no, but my story that I've been working on. But here's the thing, that project deserves you as a filmmaker at your best with experience, with resources. So don't try and make it your first project. Make your first project something that's kind of easy. And that doesn't mean it has to be boring or silly or simple, but something that you don't mind if it doesn't turn out great that you won't be sacrificing the last several years of your creative endeavors if it doesn't all go according to plan. Because hashtag no movie goes according to plan. Every finished product is going to be wildly different than what you originally intended for it to be. So, so take that idea and give it the reverence that it needs by putting it to the side and coming back to it once you've got the skill set for it. Having said all of that, let me now also say this. There are a number a numberous, a numberous, a numberless amount of YouTube videos, books, courses, podcasts, all talking about the craft of writing a story. 
You can spend the rest of your life absorbing the wisdom of experienced professionals and everything that they have to teach about writing a story. And I encourage everyone to listen to several of those, read several of those books, absorb that information. But what I don't want is for everybody to think, oh my God, I need to do the equivalent of a four-year college course on screenwriting before I write my first 10-page script. Do not. Because again, your first movie is essentially an experiment that's going to be a lot of fun with your friends. So the story doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be perfect. Let me give you just a couple of things to think about while writing your story so that we can at least get it complete. And then after that, after you've made this one and you've had that experience, then you can be like, okay, I kind of see the things that I would do differently next time. And that's really what learning writing is all about, is about making those mistakes and then doing better next time. So here are the things to think about while writing your script, at least according to me. First part, we've already talked about, keep it short. If you wanna go shorter than 10 pages, fantastic. A four minute short film, perfect. You will get the exact same experience out of that as you will 15 minute one. The second, your story needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, you need to have a, a main character. Maybe that's your vampire. Maybe it's not. They need to experience something that uh, puts them in a situation where they have to make a choice. And then in making a choice, they come out different at the end of the movie than where they started at the beginning. Expanding on that, third, there needs to be some kind of conflict. Every story that we experience is worth our time because there is conflict. That's what makes drama. So it could be that a vampire is trying to lure its prey into a place where it can drink their blood. Or it could be that your vampire is trying to avoid hunters that are trying to kill it. Or your main character is a hunter that is trying to catch and kill a vampire. Or it could be that your vampire simply wakes up and has a reason why they need to get from one side of the house to the other in the middle of the day and there's sunlight streaming in all over the place. So they need to cleverly figure out a way to move from shadow to shadow, protect themselves to get to their coffin on the other side of the house. Any of those situations will work. Essentially, your main character wants something and there is another person or force that is trying to prevent them from getting it. Number four, this is a request from me. Give your character a goal, something that they want. Because a character that is trying to make something happen is far more interesting than a character that something happens to. And fifth, this is also just a request from me, put what I call an oh shit moment in there somewhere. This is, this is something that is uh, a reveal or it's a twist or it's something that the audience just does not see coming. Like, oh my God, the mother was the vampire the whole time. Or it can be a clever way to deal with a problem. Holy shit, that glass of water that's been sitting there between them the whole time was always filled with holy water. Splash. Or it can be a reveal. The main character is a descendant of Dracula? Holy shit! Or it can be as simple as, oh shit, the vampire was standing in the corner of the room this whole time? Basically, something that hits the audience that they weren't expecting. So, having gone through all of that, let's take a look at Lucy X Mina real quick, and I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about in practice. So, the first point, how long should it be? This was 17 pages, wound up being 17 minutes. That's a little longer than I suggest for your first time out, but ultimately the thing was is that it took four days to shoot. That meant 
that none of my friends had to give up anything major to be able to come and help me on it. Second of all, it has a beginning, middle, and end. The beginning is, vampire hunters show up to Lucy's lair. The middle is, she's having to deal with that and try and survive. And the end is, Lucy survives and she gets her best friend back in the process. So number three is the conflict. There are vampire hunters with guns and silver and roses and they're trying to kill Lucy. And if she can stall them long enough for the sun to go down, then she gets access to her powers and then she can make quick work of them. But damn it, they are just too well prepared. Number four is the character goal. Lucy obviously wants to survive, but in the face of her potential demise, her emotional goal is to hear her best friend's voice one more time and to basically say goodbye and thank you. And number five is the oh shit moment. Lucy's best friend suddenly walks into the middle of the situation. Wait, Mina's in charge of the vampire hunters trying to kill her? Oh shit! So those are all examples of how uh, Lucy X Mina uses all those points that I was talking about. Characters that are engaging, that uh, tells a story that makes them different at the end when they get done with, uh, you know, one or two moments that really sideswipe the audience. So now hopefully you're thinking the same thing about your vampire project. Pulling together all of the resources that you have and breaking out that writing software and starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And that is great. And your first draft doesn't even have to make any sense. It's just 10 pages. If something doesn't work, then just go ahead and change it. It doesn't take that much time. But that's why we're starting off with a 10 page script instead of a 120 page script. But if you're worried about, oh my god, is my script going to be good enough? Uh, is it going to work? Don't worry about that yet. Because we still have the fourth step in this whole process, the last step, which is your readers. That's right. The last step in this process is giving your script to some people to read. And that's also one of the benefits of writing something that's only 10 pages, is that that's a lot easier for somebody to sit down and go through than a huge 120 page screenplay. So the important thing here is who you give it to. You can give it to your mom and she'll be like, oh my God, darling, this is wonderful. You can give it to your significant other and they'll say, oh, this is so wonderful that you're following your dreams. This is all great and it feels really good to hear, but None of that actually helps you in the slightest. The person that you want to give this to is that rare individual in your life who is brutally honest and always tells you what they think. That's who you want to give your script to. Because they will be able to tell you all of the things that they like and they don't like about it and you can trust that feedback. And after you get that feedback, then give it to a couple of other people. Give it to uh, a friend who really likes movies. Give it to uh, somebody who's maybe like a writing teacher at your school or a school that's nearby you. Uh, give it to a librarian. Give it to somebody who is a different gender than you. Give it to somebody else you know who writes. And listen to all of their feedback about your script. But now here comes the most important part. Most of what they tell you is going to be absolutely useless. There's this thing that happens when people start giving their opinion about something. The first thing they do is they're like, oh, well, what, what do I really think about this? And then they'll say something and they'll say something else and then they'll realize, oh, I really, I really like the sound of my own voice giving my opinions about things. And then the next thing you know, they will keep going on and on and on and on about all the different things that they think about your project. And that's, that's fine. That's part of being a human being. That's what art is. People come to art and then they give their opinions on it. But most opinions are just that of the individual and that is broadly useless to you. In Hollywood, there's a special breed of this person, and that is the person who wants to be a writer or director, and 
they will tell you what they would do with your script. And that is the most useless information that you can possibly get from someone. So you can actually ignore most of the notes that you get from people about your screenplay, but here's what you're actually looking for. And that is when multiple people say the same thing. Those are your actual problems. If everyone says that they hate the main character, then you need to rethink that main character. If everybody says they don't understand the ending, well then, you definitely have to rewrite that ending. And if, if everybody says that they don't buy the fact that the main character would stay in the house after they see the vampire drinking the blood of their brother, then brother, you need to come up with a scene that makes that make sense. So, no problem, right? Totally easy. Now all you gotta do is stare down that blank page and come up with an award-winning screenplay. <laughs> but here's the thing. Don't worry about trying to make this first vampire movie perfect. Filmmaking is an art. It's not a lottery. No one has ever made a brilliant film their first time out. And any time you think you've heard that story, that's because a publicist came up with it in order to make their client look more sexy to producers. This first movie is about you just getting time in the chair. It's about making your mistakes, it's about having a lot of fun with your friends, and it's about finding your voice. You can stress out about movie number three being brilliant. Movie number one, we just want you to be able to finish it, to get it done. So, write your 10 to 15 page script, give it to some people to read, make the changes that you need to make, and then we move on to the next step, which is pre-production. And that will be episode three of your vampire movie. Your vampire movie! You are making a vampire movie! That's wonderful! If you're just coming to this channel for the first time, or if you are sitting down to write your vampire story and you're like, what, what am I doing with my vampires? There is an entire series on this channel called Your Vampire Project that is all about vampire storytelling and sort of how to craft your vampire characters and make them interesting and believable and sexy and dark and powerful and tragic and brooding and all the things. So feel free to check that out if you want some inspiration on your story proper. So best of luck, and we'll see you next time for pre-production.